Some of you might recognise me from being the idiot who forgot he was supposed to come on from that side and so had to run across the screen. Uh, the purpose of these talks is a luminary of the screen is interviewed by another luminary of the screen. Sadly, one was not available. So you've had to make do with me, for all intents and purposes, some guy. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be here to talk to Jesse Armstrong, uh, the writer of uh, writer and creator of Peep Show uh, and Succession, and also one of the writers behind The Thick of It and In The Loop, and I think it's going to be a very enlightening discussion. Now, Jesse has actually put a call out for questions on Twitter, so he actually has some... He, he's, he's correctly identified me as being fundamentally so useless <laughs> that he may need to question himself at points. <laughs> Uh, when I have become flustered and allowed things to go off the rails. Uh, he's also <laughs> written down some wisdom. This, these are his words. He's written some wisdom. Uh, and so occasionally I will just be throwing to Jesse and saying, Jesse, hit us with some wisdom. Um, but uh, let's please make him feel very welcome. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how are you? Oh uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm quite knackered. We did the we had the uh, premiere of the show in New York on Tuesday, and then we did this London Film Festival event last night. So I'm um, yeah, I might become kind of lucid dreaming and start saying almost anything. So hit me. <laughs> Today's the time to hit me for some. It could. It's not only going to be screenwriting wisdom. It could become spiritual and uh, therapeutic wisdom. Um, I want to start by asking you something. When I was watching Roman Roy masturbate on the window of his office. I thought we said we weren't going to do this. But <laughs> yeah. Looking at a view of Manhattan, the last thing on my mind was, I bet the bloke who wrote this got his start in children's TV. <laughs> so imagine my surprise uh, when in my period of research, brackets, binging Jesse this morning, uh, that I found you st one of your first writing gigs was in kids' TV. Yeah, uh, and a lot of my career... Uh, happy to talk about it a lot has been in collaboration and for many many yes. years with Sam Bain and we wrote to, we started writing together on kids shows children's tv queen's nose uh, my parents are aliens tracy beaker and um yeah uh, I'm, I'm really keen to know what people are interested in hearing about and people who are interested in writing themselves i imagine there's a few in the crowd would you even do a show of hands of like people who've either written something or would write something or interested in the craft of writing Good, right, like lots of people, right? That's so, most of the people in the room. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to talk about craft and that sort of stuff and how to get into it, if you can. And, and t you know, in the American TV model, there's lots of ways in, in you know, there are a lot, certainly were and, and still are shows with teams of writers who you could join at a more junior level um, by writing a spec script, a, a specimen of their, of their show, and you could get in. Um, the, the British world of TV and media is sort of more diffuse and confusing and there's maybe you're going through radio you can say shit <laughs> not shit but you know how like there's yeah, these right. weird yeah. ways in and radio's one of them and, yeah. and kids TV is another and it's very it certainly was and I think still is run by really smart people who have structures they need to get out quite a lot of episodes and they know how to help younger writers come through so it was it was incredibly important part of us learning our craft was getting that chance to come onto a show which is set up and has producers and story uh, um, uh, story editors who, who who will help you um, develop your craft and you and Sam met at university right yeah and did you start writing then because you actually but you actually had other jobs before you actually got into this right yeah I, w I worked as a as a really terrible uh political researcher um and <laughs> sam worked in all yeah all, all sorts of things yeah so but so we after university we did other things for a bit and we was that was there always a sort of ambition for you what what was the kind of what was a piece of television or film that you watched when you were a kid and you thought how did that happen and i would like to be involved in making that happen but yeah i guess those that, like that early creative thing was things like uh, The Young Ones and Not Nine O'Clock News. That was my generation's sort of like, oh, fuck, I'm, I didn't know you were allowed to do stuff like that on, yeah. on TV. I don't think I had any thought that I would do it. But then Sam and I's era was like, uh, you know, Gary Shandling's show and yeah. Larry Sanders and Seinfeld. And I think by then we'd both been writing prose, but we both admired those and Woody Allen movies and a lot of other 
comedies of that time and, and started thinking, oh, maybe we could have a go at it. So how do you make the jump from that to actually working professionally and doing things like Queen's Nose and Tracy Beaker? What's the kind of... I just want to fill in that gap. Sure, briefly. and that, you know, and for people who are interested, the, you know, uh, you probably know this, but the, the, this, the, the prime kind of gatekeeper in, in the British world is the agent, and getting an agent is the bit that people like me will tell you to try and do, and is a, the tough part because they're, you know, fielding a lot of submissions, but <clears throat> once you have an agent, um, people ta start taking you a bit more more seriously in, in terms of not uh, being more likely to read your stuff. Not that you can't do it without an agent, and there are lots of places that will read your stuff before you have one, but you're just more, they're more likely to take you seriously. Okay, and did you have scripts that you guys had written to take to agents? Like, did you have yeah. a pilot outline that you... Uh, yeah. And was it anything that we'd have seen? Was it a kind of proto-peep show, or was it something completely different? No, I think the first thing we wrote was kind of a proto-peep show. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. It, well, it didn't have the formal um, uh, technique of, of hearing, but it was, it was similar characters, uh, or not completely dissimilar characters. And then we, and then we also c came up with tons of shows which were not a good idea. <laughs> and everyone agreed. <laughs> Can you tell us one of the shows? I was thinking about this the other day. We did for years. We were like, I guess we are Gen Xers, me and Sam. I, like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I'm 50, he is too. So we, this was the 90s. And for some reason, we thought that uh, we were talking about cool guys before. I, uh, <laughs> just to fill in, uh, we found out, I don't think I'm supposed to say this, and you can edit it out of the broadcast if I'm not, but Beyonce was at the film festival on the opening night and they had a security operation uh, and they caught, the code name for it was Operation Red Sparrow. That's just something <laughs> we found out. So I started saying, is there a security operation for us? And would it be called Operation Cool Guys? <laughs> and everybody looked at me, uh, kind of in the way that a lot of you are looking at me right now, actually, funnily enough. Um, yeah, what, what was the cool guy's idea? Well, the cool guy, I, I think we thought that the, this, there would be this cool guy who worked in a video shop. And, <laughs> and, he, and he smoked a lot of weed and he'd just be so cool that you'd want to watch a show about him. And um, we that, did, we, you, I mean, you are, you are wrong. You're describing Kevin Smith's entire career, Jesse. Yeah, Kevin Smith, maybe not as world renowned as he might be. Or, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I think. We found a guy with very low motivation who occasionally said mildly sarcastic things to people who came into his video shop. Turned out not to be a great plot motive. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it does, sound, I mean, it does sort of sound like the plot of a lot of films and television shows that came out in the kind of early to mid '90s, right? So you weren't totally off base. Maybe, maybe, yeah. But I, I it's if a, 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 clue, a clue in writing that could be the per, first page of my wisdom is it's great if you have characters who want something, and this was essentially a guy who didn't want anything apart from to have another joint and <laughs> kick back because he was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sort of leads us perfectly into Peep Show, insofar as this is the absolute opposite of that in terms of them being cool guys. Um, so if the first, one of the first things that you guys wrote was a proto-Peep Show, how does that then evolve into what we end up seeing in the first episode of Peep Show? Yeah, a couple of good things which, uh, you know, uh, were we met David and Robert doing a team writing exercise at the BBC, which was kind of disastrous, but it did, we did meet them and admired them uh, and asked if they'd be interested in us writing something for them. And uh, I think there was, a, there was a, separately there was an idea at Channel 4 of doing like a really cheap show. Some people might remember Beavis and Butthead, which was like animated thing of people watching those guys watching videos and commenting. A couple of cool guys <laughs> <laughs> watching, watching videos and commenting. And so this was going to be like a really cheap format where they like watch TV and I guess there were a couple of cool, slightly stoned guys what, uh, making jokes. And, and How much marijuana were you smoking, Jesse, <laughs> at this point? We, were, we weren't, uh, yeah, we, I think we just admired, <laughs> admired the, uh, the, the milieu. But um, <laughs> anyway, to make it into a half hour, we had to come up with something for them to do while they weren't watching TV and being puckish about it. And so it was a natural progression. That, oh, wow, maybe we'd do that thing. Sam had seen a documentary at the time where they put a, a camera on the model supermodels caprice's head and she just walked around and you we he was very taken with it like you they showed her walking around and going to her fridge and like going oh i've only got a moolah yogurt left and um it was it was that that <laughs> level of insight and the camera is like the peep show the camera, camera like, was right, on her there? head it was called being caprice after being john malkovich and um <laughs> uh 
And I, I think what really struck him, and, we, and uh, I liked it too, was that mundanity of like, oh, I've got some jam left, and I wonder how long that'll last. And, uh, and so that tone, which hopefully we juiced up a bit for the show, but <laughs> is still there, is like, yeah, it's weird, isn't it, what you think when you look in your fridge. Um, so those two ideas so was there So was there a more conven- conventional version of Peep Show where, you, where the camera was kind of flat and we were just watching the two guys, or was it always conceived of as being the It was always conceived with those. With the, we, we used to write it in two columns what you'd see and what you would uh, what they said and what they were thinking oh right so early literally on. the scripts were laid out yeah. with an external and an internal monologue yeah early on that's that's some insight <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even a professional interviewer and I think it's fair to say you've winkled cool it out of me <laughs> <laughs> this cool guy is absolutely nailing it um, the, there's a quote from someone from one of your collaborators, Chris Morris, about the writing of Peep Show specifically, and he described you and Sam Bain as being the ultimate word in flawed male psychology. And when I was reading that quote, I thought there is a line that you can like. If Mark Corrigan had a cousin in America, it would not be a long stretch to imagine that it would be Tom Wamsgans. And there is some, there is, it seems to be an interest that you have in these kind of exposed, they're almost like exposed nerves. They're so oversensitive. Are you observing that or are you writing about yourself? Did you say exposed nerves? Yeah, or like nerds? just. Oh. <laughs> Overexposed nerds. Um, I, well, I guess both. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know how fancy we want to go, but we're in the film festival, so we can go a little let's fancy. Go, let's go fancy, baby. I, I think masculinity and what the, you know, how uh, men have changed, you know, there's been lots of social movements in my, in, in, in my little bit of lifetime, but feminism has probably been, you know, the one that we grew up with most, and how men have changed in relation to that is... Uh, yeah, it's not like I ever sat down thinking that's, let's, let, I want to write about that yeah. but I think I've written a lot of men um, in, in my career and with Sam um, and, and I think that's an, in, it's an interesting area uh, This is probably a good time for our first uh, clip um, of the afternoon um, so the clip comes from the sixth episode of series four uh, of Peep Show called The Wedding and uh, Mark uh, having lusted after Sophie for most of the previous three series uh, has finally landed her, and they are about to get married, and he has had a catastrophic case of cold feet. And they found uh, a little room in the church when the wedding ceremony is about to start to hide out. And the most important piece of other background information you know is that need to know is that Jeremy really needs a piss. Um, it's a good... I feel like our discussion of feminism, where we didn't get as far as I'd hoped, is going to be well match <laughs> peace and it's going to show me to be at the top of my game and in terms of fourth generation it's feminism the sacred discourse. and the profane yeah. <laughs> um, could we play that clip please <laughs> it's good stuff <laughs> um, in the construction of something yeah. like that how do you build to something like that is it a, que- a question of you going God, it would be funny if we were able to get to a place where Jez is pissing on wedding guests. Or is that is it is it the other way around where you're like, this can only end with Jeremy pissing on everyone? Uh, well, you know, and I feel it feels funny watching it without Sam here. You know, who who we wrote such a collaboration between us. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, honestly, how, how did we? We used to think a lot about plot and work on it hard. I think mainly mainly we'd go what would happen next, what would happen next, right. and then maybe with a little bit of, an, it, could we get to there, um, and, and working back to fill out the blanks. But, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of plot chat. <laughs> um, now, Jesse uh, would like to open out to the floor um, as early as possible to try and get people. So what I thought we would do, I was very against it. <laughs> I was like, I want to interact with these people as little as possible. <laughs> um, but what I thought we would do is go clip by clip. So if people have a specific question about Peep Show... Uh, now might be a good time to to ask it. It's an impo- I think it's a, it's one of those ones that 
there's not a I don't think there's a handy way if if you're a writer and if, if you're having one of those issues I don't know if there's a handy way to figure it out you know some things we we wrote of pretty much the show Fresh Meat that Sam and I did about university undergraduates we wrote a version of that and it no one wanted it they just thought it was like yeah what a house share and there's like five cool cool men and women <laughs> together yeah I don't brilliant. like that this has become a catchphrase for me <laughs> Um, and, and no one wanted it. And then 10 years later, when we'd uh, had some more success, people thought, oh, maybe that would be interesting. So I guess if it keeps interesting you as a writer, that, then there might be something to go back to. But also there is a point with, um, I think our cool guy show was called Spencer, when you have to go, you know what, people, people seem to hate this. <laughs> should, we, should we not try and force this down their gullets? Maybe, maybe there's a good reason. So it's a really tough one. And similarly with plot elements that you're trying to fit in that you don't know if they work or not. I, r I wish I knew when to leave things alone and when, and I guess it's, it's just got to be how much enthusiasm you have yourself for, for the idea. Um, this seems like a good time to go to our book of wisdom. Wisdom? For a quick hit of oh, Jesse Wisdom. It's going to be great. Here we go. Don't write any jokes. <laughs> Do you want to elaborate on that or just leave it as, as is? I think this was what I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about um, this was specifically for comedy writers. Um, I mean, because it's easier for drama writers not to write any jokes. <laughs> but um, I, I think that uh, something that Sam and I always found is, you know, s sitcom, sit short for situation comedy, and you can spend a lot of time thinking, oh, if we get the, if it was the 80s, the vicar round and the trousers off, this will be a funny. Uh, <laughs> situation and maybe that would be a funny situation but <laughs> if you if you've got good characters that will always produce more funny stuff than trying to think of the shape of a hilarious line that scene that once it, if if you find it amusing it, the dialogue which we took a lot of time over and hopefully is crafted and is the right words and prayer bucket and things I'm proud of they're <laughs> funny words that make me laugh but the characters and the situation are doing carrying ninety percent of your of your have they done ninety percent of your work at that point, and 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 if you try and throw in a very crafted joke or one liner, it'll often fall flat compared to just the the real thing that one person would say to another in the middle of that very stressful situation, and that can be a relief. I'm not a great if I was working on your show, I, I would get fired because I'm not good at coming up with zingers uh <laughs> as you call them uh, and, uh, i'm but, a cool guy who does zingers <laughs> but i can think about characters and try and think what they would say in that moment and hopefully the comedy comes out of that and it can be quite sustaining and so a line like my favorite line in peep show uh is the character of johnson who comes to jlb credit and says what this department needs is a kick up the arse so hard my foot will go right up your digestive tract and wiggle out of your mouth like a little leather tongue that's <laughs> yeah. That, well, <laughs> that seems pretty crafted. <laughs> yeah, in, I mean, and, in, and that's why presumably uh, we're people who want to be writers are writers because we. That I guess you have to you have to love that stuff, and in the end you're going to do it. But it's secondary to want c coming up with the character of Alan Johnson and what sort of guy he is, and then that's the sort of thing he said. And if it wiggled out of his mouth like something else, it hopefully might be equally amusing. But it has to be real, organic to the character and organic to the specific situation. Don't write any jokes. Don't write any jokes, <laughs> OK? If you want to be a cool guy. Um, so you and Sam have this great success with Peep Show. It's a very beloved sitcom, Fresh Meat Gets Off the Ground. And then uh, at a certain point, Armando Iannucci pulls you into his orbit. How did you end up working on the thick of it and then subsequently end up going on to In the Loop? Uh, yeah, I'd worked a bit in politics, so it was a natural fit. Sam was doing some other stuff. We worked a bit on it together. Then he was doing other stuff and, and found the, I think I found the world more amenable because uh, I, I knew a bit about politics. And, yeah, that was another very lovely set of collaborations I with Armando. Dwell, Go on. I don't want to dwell too much, but I do think it is worth... What, what, was, what was your actual job in politics? I was a researcher for an MP, um, but I was just hopeless. I was a young man who didn't have any contacts in the political world, didn't know how to write a speech, could hardly write a letter. I was, I was just a terrible researcher, <laughs> I think. I've just got visions of a Labour MP <laughs> standing up and using the phrase, little leather tongue. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> and did Armando know that? And was that why he pulled you in? Or was it a kind no, of No, I think he'd seen Peep Show. Yeah, right, okay. Um, and yeah. how did that collaboration work? Because there was a kind of core group of you. 
that kind of defined the tone of that show. How developed was the idea when you came on board? Pretty developed. Uh, he, uh, Armando had a, had done castings and. Um, he knew what he knew what the shape of it was that there'd be this department and that there would be um, uh, a Malcolm Tucker figure. Malcolm is actually named after someone I used to play five a side football with and would crash me up against the sidings <laughs> and destroy my body. And wait, uh, is it the name Malcolm or the name Malcolm Tucker? The whole the whole Malcolm <laughs> Tucker. Um, so uh, uh, so, but the the. The, the 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 scenario was 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 set by arm, but then yeah, the, m me and uh, Simon Blackwell and Tony Roach, and uh, Ian Martin were the core group. I think on the first for, at first for Ar Armando did this smart thing, which in the world of being able to make stuff yourself and put on the internet is maybe inspiring. Is that BBC gave him money on BBC Four, which had a low, very low budget anyway, to make one pilot, and he was like, okay, let's go to the Guinness factory in Royal Oak, which was closing down, and shot three episodes for the money that they gave him for one episode right uh, and and um yeah he he, he, had, he was a producer as well so he's very adept at, at that part of the business when was the decision maybe it's made even before you got on but when was the decision made to never mention the name of the, i don't think there is a specific mention of the names of the parties they talk about the government they talk about the opposition but there's never a sense when was that decision made consciously well that's part that's all i'd say I'm very proud of my involvement with the show and I wrote a lot of the pilot but that I think Armando had the texture of how that would work he knew he knew what the boundaries were of what you of what would what would make it um feel sort of timeless and not timeless but not too specifically satirical about the government of the day while also sort of basically feeling like a new labor world it's fascinating do you have a theory as to why, because I remember living through that period and the cultural conversation very much being like, how do you lay a finger satirically on New Labour when they've sort of focus grouped every single politician into oblivion? And so they've almost, they've been trying to satire proof their political figures. Do you have a sense of why it is the thick of it was able to be the only thing that I think really laid a finger properly on Blair and New Labour? Oh, well, uh, that's, yeah, if that's true, that's, that's an accolade. I don't, uh, um, well, I'd say that, like a lot of good th things, there's quite, a th and this is maybe useful as writers, I sometimes don't think you need that many insights. I mean, you need a lot of insights into characters, people, situations, things, the minutiae. But I'd say that the thick of it, its insight is presentation has overtaken policy. Like, that's... That's it to me, what, what that show was saying and what, what happens when that happens. And so maybe having that clarity in there helped, and it, I think it was true, right? We feel it and it's happened more rather than less. Yeah. Having a clarity of approach rather than saying a million things about Blair being Bambi and Brown being sullen and I don't know. You, yeah. it, having, having a clarity of approach, I guess. Um, and in the grand tradition of the On the Buses film and the long episode of Only Fools and Horses in Spain, it then became a film, right? It then became... It, what, what was the first inkling of an idea for the movie? And, and why was the decision made to keep the core cast, the repertory, but maybe have them play different named characters apart from Malcolm Tucker, who is very much Malcolm Tucker? Yeah, that's all arm. And it's, I mean, if you, if you pick... If you, it seems to work, I think, when you see the film. I think if you walked in and said that we're going to do a thing which is like the thing but everyone's going to be sort of different but sort of the same you'd be like yeah okay do you want to think about it some more maybe? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it evidently it worked um uh and that's all that was all, that was i think like that thing that arm had of like he could he could feel what the boundaries should be within the satire and how close it should be to real world and how far away he had a good sense and he was angry about the war yeah. uh, in iraq and so i think that film whatever its demerits it's 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 got somebody who's really fucking angry about something uh at the heart of it which which gives it a um gives it its momentum um so this scene we're gonna play a clip from uh, from in the loop now um i i mean i still think that this is the 
the, you, you've been involved in the two best War on Terror movies. Like, I think between this and Four Lions, I, I don't think that there's been... It, like, cinema hasn't really got to grips with what happened in the War on Terror. I, and, I mean, there's stuff like The Hurt Locker and Green Zone, which deal with the combat, but... It's more about the cool guys. <laughs> uh, Zero Dark Thirty kicking yeah, down the course. doors. Yeah, that's right. It is... This it, torture's pretty... It's not nice, but come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But Jessica Chastain <laughs> can wear a pair of sunglasses, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. So there's... Yeah, there's an element... It feels like a lot of the cinema that's come out about it feels like a sort of offshoot of the kind of military-industrial complex, whereas this movie is properly furious about the circumstances of the war. In terms of whether it worked or not, you guys were nominated for an Academy Award in 2010 for adapted screenplay, and it, I really think that re-watching this movie again and again, it stands up in such a fantastic way. So the clip that we're going to show... Uh, when I last rewatched this, I actually was watching it with my partner and I said, this is a perfect example of how to execute a comedic set piece. And she said, why do you speak like this? <laughs> Whose benefit is this for? Like, why, who are you, what audience are you talking to? Now, I have an audience and I've been able to get that off my chest. And she's here and I hope she enjoyed that. <laughs> um, in this scene... Uh, General George Miller, played by James Gandolfini, and the Assistant Secretary of State, Karen Clark, played by Mimi Kennedy, have convened in a house, and they're plotting against the rise of the war. And they need to do this in a clandestine way, so they find a location for their meeting and some props to help them along with it that maybe are not suitable for the conversations that they're having about troop deployments in a war. So can we play that clip now? At the end of a war, you need some soldiers left, or it looks like you've lost. It's like one of those things where it's it, it's a joke and a punch in the gut. Um, how? What was the mechanism behind writing a film like that? Are you all sat in a room together trying to beat out the story? Then do you take your individual bits of it away? Yeah, I'm I'm terrible at remembering how things happen, but. Um yeah, we do, we do relatively, I, I do for succession uh, like a more traditional American writer's room where we're all together for weeks, months on end, coming in every day. Armando's much more ad hoc and you do, we do meetings sometimes, uh, he and I and then him, other writers and sometimes all of us together as a group. And he would do really quite rough kind of shapes and then we would go and write and, um, you know, it's a heavy collaboration that scene, I was. That's most of these stuff. There's so many layers you can hardly remember. But I feel like even if um, Tony and Simon were here, which I don't think they are, um, I could. They would admit, or they would agree that I mostly wrote that, or m most of that. Um, uh, but so then, so uh, it, it becomes this incredible mixture of what everyone's written, and and then you you can remember fragments of what came from where. So what have you taken away to write that scene? Have you had a conversation with uh, Armando where you've gone, wouldn't it be funny if they calculated troop deployments on a children's calculator? Or is that you just, we need to have them have the conversation and how that happens is kind of up to you? Yeah, uh, I, I, that would, I mean, Amanda, Amanda had lots of funny ideas, but I think typically that would be like, we need a bit where they, this, the bit is they're against the war right. and they're at this party and they go and talk about it. Right, okay. And then you, what, see one of your children's calculators and are like, that would be a terrible thing to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could remember. All I know is I do like children's bedrooms. There are people who watch the second episode of Succession, which we watched last night. <laughs> a lot of it happens in a children's bedroom. It's funny, right? It's a good place for things like that for some reason. I always like that. <laughs> Get um, people in the wrong room. Another, another wisdom. That, it's a great... It's, it's a great scene. I, we, I'm conscious of not wanting to spoil too much about series three of Succession, but that is a phenomenal scene. Um, does anyone have a question specifically about... Uh, just to make it clear, I will also leave time for general questions. If you want to just ask Jesse about his general vibe, there will also be time to do that at the end. But this man down here has a uh, specific question about In The Loop slash The Thick Of It. It's a great question. It's something that occurs to you and, and it must everyone who's like in the so-called satirical area. It's a question, you know. Um, uh, I don't have a I don't have an overall answer to it. I I, I think um, 
you have to be careful what you're doing. You have to be able to stand behind what you write and believe in it. And, you know, for example, the Logan Roy thing it occurred to me, you know, some people who find watch Succession don't take to it because they find the people not nice. And, um, <laughs> and then it's interesting that people who watch it more, I don't think they find the people nice, but they find them not less less unwatchable uh or watchable um and i don't think that's because their actions objectively are becoming any nicer it's because like someone you know in your life you come to know more about why they act the way they do and does that excuse them well that's that's a question i think you it's legitimate to throw back on the audience and you know you can do you can do this you can do you can make a phony excuse of that. People who make horrible movies and then blame the audience for watching them. Ah, why did you come and see this disgusting stuff? You're, you're, you're complicit. <laughs> well, hold on. I'm not complicit until I know what it is. But I think if you can stand behind the stuff that you're doing, it's like, you know, the famous modest proposal, Jonathan Swift, if you, if you think that's a recipe book that's not on, on, on the author, that's on, that's on you. You've, you've got to trust the audience and a... Hopefully, if you do interesting work, you get an audience who are interested and engaged and are not going to... But if they go out going, rah, 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 I want to be Malcolm Tucker, st you know, stick a <laughs> boot up your ass and it'll come out of your mouth, and they think that's something laudable, you, you, at a certain point, you can't take responsibility for that person. That person's just a moron. <laughs> in my view. I mean, not that there isn't, not that there isn't something, not that there isn't something in, in human beings which finds the person who takes control and seems to have a plan um, a sympathetic figure. So I wouldn't. I, I understand why people are drawn to the man, often the man who says, "This is what we're going to do." But if you watch most episodes in the thick of it, Malcolm Tucker's plans are not good plans. You know, he he, he talks a good game, but. Those episodes don't usually um, end with him him um, prevailing in the way he intended. I remember there was a b bananas thing that they did when the movie came out, where Mark Kermode took Alistair Campbell to watch it, and th I think it must have been for Front Row or something like that. Does anyone else remember this? Or if I, it sounds like a cheese dream I had once, but I remember it. Yeah, and Alistair, I mean, if it makes you feel better about it, Alistair Campbell was not happy. <laughs> He, 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 this wasn't a case of, you know, th there was this thing in the 90s where Tory politicians would actually ask to keep their spitting image puppets, where the show had become such an iconic part of the television firmament that it was now a compliment to be satirised. And, you know, you get into Trump hosting SNL and all that kind of stuff. But it's certainly in that instance, he, he, do you remember that? Yeah. He was not pleased, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, you can't control it. And, pe and you know, the culture can moves so rapidly and eats its own babies and memes itself so fast that you the, that you can't control finally how the stuff is going to be received but yeah I'm, I'm pleased you found it uncomfortable yeah uh, you know, but. yeah hit us with a piece of wisdom oh fuck um, I feel like I've been doing a bit of wisdom like, you, in oh, between, there was, yeah a bit this of constant wisdom um, this is well, a wisdom uh, festival <laughs> Uh, juice, juice the pain. This is one of Sam's, really, for writers. It's always, it's always comfortable, I think, or not comfortable. It's always nice to feel that the terrible parts of your life might be able to be um, uh, monetized. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if you can remember those awful things that happened to you and uh, reimagine them as fiction, you might be able to get paid for them. <laughs> um, Sam once was working in his video shop and uh, somebody tried to rob it and he ended up sitting on top of him um, in a probably foolhardy act of sort of um, good employee behaviour. Similar thing happened to me when I worked at Oddbins. Uh, the shop got rushed, and I, I was working facing this way, and I revolved myself 180 <laughs> degrees to become a customer <laughs> during, during, during the robbery. Uh, but um, Sam, who's a much more morally upstanding man than me, took it upon himself to wrestle this guy to the floor and ended up sitting on him. And then we put that in Peep Show as this... <laughs> Because like they, he was a kid, and suddenly like Sam, who was even then a you know a, a man, he was like sitting on this boy, and and like the cops were like, yeah, we'll be there in twenty minutes, and suddenly you're like, oh, God, I'm sitting on a boy for twenty minutes, like this isn't doesn't feel great. And, um, so uh, you can if you can take something like that and put it into your into your into your work, that's that's nice. <laughs>
Um, I want to hop to Succession, but I do briefly just want to touch on Black Mirror because I do think it's a sort of it's an interesting diversion for you. How did the Black Mirror thing come about? Is that a question that you've always had this like one great sci-fi idea that you wanted to get out of you? Or was it a case of Charlie Brooker coming to you and saying, we're doing this mad show, do you want to come up with something? Mixture, actually, yeah. I, I'm not, uh, I have a notebook. They're mostly those kind of things. What would happen if you opened the wrong bottle of wine or some, you, had to, you ended up sitting on a boy. But um, <laughs> uh, I did have one that was like, oh, Compu- computers seem to be getting so much better. This is a good insight, another piece of wisdom. Uh, you know, how much memory will they be able to have soon? And uh, I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be useful to have a thing where you could record everything that happened to you? And that would be a useful thing. And then thought about the downsides as well. And, uh, and Charlie was coming up with the show, and I'd met him through Chris. And he, 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 at that time, I think he was thinking of it as more of a maybe anthology show than it, I mean, anthology of writers show than it eventually became so um so I pitched him that and yeah it, 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 and it was an important thing for me I'd written a number of probably films and different bits and pieces that had never got made on my own but I think that was one of the first things I wrote as a solo writer of, under the tonal tutelage of, of of Charlie and Annabelle but um but that was a that was a first well, one of the first things I did on my own what are the challenges if you're somebody that's worked in episodic television or feature films of boiling such especially with such a complex and ornate idea how do you boil that down in into an hour is it a different writing methodology yeah i mean uh, and for people who haven't seen it that you the the idea is that people in the future have well not even yeah a little bit in the future have a little chip which records everything that they see through their eyes and then you're able to recall it and throw it onto a screen and watch it or just recall it yourself and yeah the once you start one of the things that Charlie Lee Brooker is brilliant at is if, like, you say that idea to him and he's, like, I remember doing a meeting with him and he's like, oh, my God, then what would happen is that in kids' changing rooms, uh, everyone would have to wear white sheets because otherwise the paedophile parents of other kids would be watching the kids change and so everyone would go to school with a shroud and you'd be like, fuck, Charlie, you got there pretty, <laughs> pretty quick. And, 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 but he can just, he's great at, like extrapolating which is why that shows such a good vehicle for his talents uh, uh, weirdly what he helped me to do with the show with that f- script was i think i wrote a like a what was probably a 200 million dollar movie version of it with all sorts of extrapolations and a bit like the thick of it one of the good um uh, disciplines was to turn it into a bit of a chamber piece and go i think my idea was always about jealousy and the you know how forgetting is maybe also important as you go through life as well as remembering and um he helped turn it into something which was achievable on a budget and also maybe more emotionally uh, poignant did you there's something weird about rewatching it and going oh it's almost like someone's come up with peep show technology like when you because because a lot of it the the memory certainly that you see are POV cameras yeah. and so it, it, there was a, I had a strange thing because I rewatched it all this week because I'm a serious well journalist guys <laughs> uh, and it, it was an interesting thing when I was watching it again in view of trying to set it in context of your canon and thinking oh there's some kind of you're because- saying I've just have got one idea <laughs> I've got one idea that's what he's saying I'm fuck saying- you I'm off. <laughs> Let's get on to succession. Oh my God. <laughs> this is going to be no, like the I, BDs I, I, I on Clive Anderson. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, and it's very true. It, um, it's sad peep show. Sad, <laughs> horrible peep show. Which is already quite sad and horrible. <laughs> um, wh- what was the challenge about? Because, you know, it is a more dramatic piece, e- even maybe more than succession. I mean, there is a joke in it. And it's a deli- sort of a bad joke, and the debate around it a lot of it is this. What was the challenge of stepping away, moving away from writing something? I mean, obviously, as we've said, you're not writing jokes in situations, and, but the situations and the characters are guiding towards comedy. How do you recalibrate when the situation and the characters are driving towards drama? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, um, what's interesting to say about that? I feel like, um, anyway... Um, I wanted to, uh, happy to talk about Succession, but I'll talk, I feel like Black Mirror's, if you've seen that episode, this is, might be interesting, but if you haven't, it might not be. But um, the writing for that drama, well, one thing to say is that I think the original, it, it, the, the, that sh- 
anthology series came to contain a lot of tones. When I wrote my one, I didn't know he hadn't, he hadn't made any of them, but the, the one he pitched me was the Prime Minister's going to fuck a pig. Yeah. So tonally... It Back seemed, when that was a joke. <laughs> well, it seemed like a joke to me, but it, um, uh, it, it felt... I didn't, know, I didn't know what tonal area he was going to hit, and in some ways I wasn't... Uh, as in control of the tonal final product in the edit, right. in the or who, who how we directed and did the piece, so it has some twists of a sort of nasty, weird, comic um, approach to yeah. this. That you, there's, there's, I guess, a, it thinks a lot about the ironies and. Um, contradictions and difficulties of such a situation rather than driving towards the wow sci-fi bit of it so I guess that's you know people sometimes talk about succession and about how uh, the tonal thing of it's, ob it's obviously hopefully funny but it's also uh, a drama and um, how do those things interrelate or well, I feel like they interrelate well and that the, a comic take on a situation can be a twist on that traumatic interaction that doesn't ne doesn't necessarily produce a, the spark of laughter. It can be a sort of spark of horror or a spark of of understanding. You can, I think, comedy can go in its broadest sense can go lots of places. Well, to succession then. Is Roman going to marry Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> That is the only question when I ask people what they would be interested in. They seemed interested in me asking. Or that was certainly the first question that was at the top of, why is everybody so fascinated with Rerry? Is that what we're calling them? <laughs> Roman Jerry. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's not a good, great reflection on the audience. I mean, <laughs> he, 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 their relationship, I think, so far portrayed on screen involves him going into bathrooms and masturbating while she pretends not to know what's going on outside. It's not a good model for, our, for the next generation of how, how things should go. So I think relationship, I would question romance, some people call it. I, I, would, I would query that description of their, of their relationship. I guess um, uh, they're both great actors, uh, and I guess it feels unusual, but hopefully also it doesn't feel... Um, there's something that feels real about it which is you know I think when the show works it feels real and um, it's it's both unusual and real at the same time and, and that that's like oh that's interesting isn't it as an audience yeah so you had a there was a screenplay for a film called the Murdochs yep. at one time does that did that feed into I mean it did that feed into succession yeah in, in any way is, is this yeah. the logical extension of that it did feed into it it's not the logical extension so I wrote it about 10 years before we did succession um, I read a lot about Rupert Murdoch and his family. We couldn't get it away. It was like a t sort of TV play or single drama. Um, and then when Peep Show was ending, I was thinking about other projects. I watched, um, I forget what the documentary was called about the Durst's, the property magnets in, um, in, you know, that was on HBO. I watched that and I read um, Sumner Redstone, who's another big American um, magnet, and I read the Tom Boyer's Maxwell book and some stuff about Hearst and anyway started reading a lot about these media moguls and felt they some of the Redstone and Murdoch both may have made the same joke uh, Redstone's de dead now but they both were asked um, uh, when what what would happen when they died and they both said they didn't plan to die <laughs> and um, it just struck me as like what what what's going on for these men in their 80s and 90s who are who are still packing their diaries every day and felt like something quite basic about not wanting to give up and and fearing that loss of influence and the end of your life and um uh yeah it just i i started to feel there was a show about what those people are like in general and not just in the specific how quickly do you get from that idea to the tone of something is there a version is there an iteration of succession that was more just a straight up you know drama maybe without the jokes it, it was there a sort of more drier version in a sense no the, uh i wrote it quickly pretty quickly and it adam mckay who had agreed to direct it who's did the big short and anchorman and uh vice latterly um 
uh, was warm. It, it went pretty quick. It went scarily quick from my point of view. I, I'm used to, me and Sam do used to do tons and tons of drafts. I still do tons and tons of drafts. But like I was showing them like, because I was doing, working on my own first, second, third drafts. But they were very, people thought the tone worked and it was always the tone that it is. Right. And how much of the arcs for the individual characters did you have a sense of? Because I read this thing that Alan Ruck said when he went in for his audition for Connor, the line that Adam McKay fed him was that he was to say, Dad, I want to be president. And it was not supposed to be something that we were supposed to take seriously. Like, how much was in place in your head from the very beginning? Um, not... Um, how much... I I'm bad at actually remembering these things, and you can, it's so easy to um, uh, reinvent the past. Uh, uh, not much. Yeah. Very, very, very little. I had a sense of the world. Um, I, I think in, it's been said in some interviews that I, I think I said that I thought that Logan Roy might die at the end of the first episode. That was certainly true. Certainly thought he might end at the, die at the end of the first series. Um, but those, they were never definitive. They were just like, oh, vague feelings. And as soon as I was writing it, I knew he shouldn't die at the end of the first episode. And as soon as we were in the room for the first season, I knew he shouldn't die at the end of the first season. Um, is that because you you sort of feel the magnetism? Feel, of, like, you feel Matt Brian this, Cox? This is the, the planet that, or the sun that they're revolving around. Let, I mean, it might be fascinating one day to find out what happens when that goes, but not, not yet. Um, so yeah, I, had a, I think I had a very good sense of what the world was like and what we would say and what we would do. But until we went into the writer's room, I had very little sense of where their trajectories would go. I want to, I want to talk about the casting and the individual actors that are selected for a second. But I just want to quickly say, in terms of you knowing the tone, how easy did that make building the writer's room? Because the succession writer's room is a sort of fascinating collaboration of you know, comedy writers that you've, Tony Roche and Georgia Pritchett, who you worked with for a long time, and then playwrights like Lucy Preble. Was it, once you knew that it was going to sit in this slightly uncomfortable place, did you know very quickly that you were going to need to staff it with a mixed ability room? Um, uh, mixed genres rather mixed than genres. abilities. Sorry, mixed uh, um, uh, <laughs> did, you need, did you think you need a couple of shit people in there? Just, <laughs> just to even Very it out. encouraging for everyone else to have <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I guess. I, what I want, I knew, uh, I knew a couple of things. I knew I wanted um, sort of half and half British and American, sort of half and half men and women, and that yeah, it would be good not to have just pals who I knew from the sitcom writing world who would be comfortable. And I, and I knew it was important to have those American voices so that we were properly integrated into American culture and politics. Plus, we have a panoply of exec producers and advisors who help us with that stuff. Um, Theatre theater is not the world I knew very much, but what I... Susan Sunhi Stanton, who's yeah. American, who's on it, as well as Lucy, and um, Lucy Kirkwood sometimes uh, is around the show. She's rarely available to come in. And um, Alice Birch, who, who's a playwright, has sometimes made herself available. What I loved about those people when they started to come in was how seriously playwrights get taken um, in terms of their work. And there's there's a thing, you know, I was talking, we were talking about the how hard it is to get in and the um, working on kids shows. And you you learn to be you learn to be adaptable uh, to to make a living as a writer in the UK. Can you write this? Will you do a rewrite? And it's if you want to be a certain sort of employed writer, it's wise to be say yes, and yes, I'll do the notes, and yes, I'll do another draft, and try and accommodate all the thoughts. And that's, I would recommend that. That's good. And sometimes you're dealing with people you don't respect, and you can try and uh, not, not do the notes. <laughs> I was going to try and think of a technical term for that, but there isn't one. Uh, and hopefully you're working a lot of the time with people who you do respect, and you want to take their notes. Um, but there is something that can get ground down in you a little bit in terms of your the um, the clarity of your maybe not the clarity of your vision, but your how much natural respect you command when you come into the room, which because of the tradition of theatre, playwrights carry with them in a in a nice way. And so I liked having some people in there. Not that me and Tony and Georgia and John don't take our work seriously, but. It's just different playwrights, and it's, 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 it's a good atmosphere to have in the room. Um, um, I've heard you use the, the phrase blood on the page 
about having the playwrights in the room. What does what do you what do you sort of mean by that? Can we cut their mean? arms open <laughs> and we take the blood and we. Uh, I think that's Lucy's phrase. Yeah, I think you know there can be you can sometimes shy, even as a writer who knows that they want to do interesting stuff and examine relationships and painful stuff as well as funny stuff. You can um, shy away from going to the heart of the matter or saying something really uncomfortable and driving towards that and like putting yourself out there maybe sounds a little bit melodramatic. I don't think that happens a lot, but it ha happens in our writer's room that's, that people, um, hopefully it's a nice, collaborative, safe-feeling environment and people will talk about their familial and personal relationships in a way that can be quite honest and... Um, that, that, that's very helpful. To Juice the pain. Juice the pain. <laughs> um, let's have a quick look at the uh, Series 3 trailer for Succession. It's exciting stuff. It's very exciting. I don't like to be on the screen, same area as the guy who plays Stewie because he literally looks like someone put my face through an Instagram filter. <laughs> I really don't feel comfortable with that at all. Um, <laughs> Um, I want to talk quickly about two things that you said that I think actually speak to a very good question that was asked earlier. You said that if that the, the show should have a view of how the world works and how people work, uh, and that should be expressed in every frame of the show, but it should never be explicitly stated, otherwise it would be turgid propaganda. And you also said you don't want to be in a situation where you're doing PR for them, meaning wealthy people. How do you... It feels like those are two competing objectives that you have to try and balance, and how do you make sure that you're you're empathising with these characters without fetishising their lifestyle? Well, I don't think they're competing, are they? Because one, if I understand myself correctly... <laughs> the, not my <laughs> question, mate. I'm just saying, restating what you said. I think it, the, point, the point of view of the show that should be shot through it is the same one which is not take, doing PR for them. So... We, the rich people live in nice places, or can afford to live in rich, ni nice places, um, but we don't want to be in the business of selling you on that or making it any nicer than it is or adding a veneer of sexy glamour or shimmer to what still might objectively be a, a big, nice house, or sometimes not that nice. You know, so a lot of the time when we went and did research and looked at these places, you know, if you have 12 homes or even five homes, you end up getting an interior designer who makes them all look like international hotels. And <laughs> just, you know, how many paintings can you really love? How many objects mean something to you? They, the spaces that the, these people live in are often quite anonymous, um, and that's interesting. Anyway, so, yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction between yeah. trying to not do the PR and having a view in every bit of the show. We Were any of the parts written specifically for specific actors or was it all a case of you got the script and then you try and find people to fit into those specific roles yeah unusually for me not often I have people in mind and maybe I had people in mind but then uh, but not in a sometimes this is might be useful to writers sometimes it can be useful to put photos on the wall of the people who you think might play the characters and they just become more real to you um I didn't physically do that but we finished the script and then it went out to to be cast in a in a traditional way and I don't think we I had anyone to to I, I suggested Matthew um, I yeah. think because he wasn't as well known to the Americans but um, McKay suggested uh, Brian who I was very excited to think about offering it to but that was his idea but it, yeah it went through a normal casting process. What have you seen in Matthew McFadden? Because he, because he played so many of these like he was in Spooks and he's this kind of put together. Where did you see? the vulnerability in that guy, like the fucked up sad man. <laughs> uh, well, I, I thought for once I had an actual answer to one of your questions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what, what, I remember him being very funny and he did, um, there was an adaptation of The Way We Live Now, the Trollope novel in the 90s and he played a sort of swell, um, a bumptious young man and he was very, very, very funny doing that role. So I always remembered, you know, seeing him in more, straighter roles that he ha had that in him. He was also in Dave and Rob's uh, show Ambassadors doing a comic role. But um, the extra layer of vulnerability and um, 
uh, I don't know. He's just an exceptional actor. I always knew, I always just felt that he was going to, he could do anything that you threw at him. But I, that, it was that specific role that made me think, oh, he's really funny as well. He really knows comedy. Who was the hardest person, who was the hardest character to cast? I think it was Kendall. Um, yeah. The others came together pretty easily, but he carried so much, he carried so much of the emotional weight of the show. Um, we sort of, it wasn't a iron-clad thing, and these actors were not in any way unknown, especially Brian. But we, our philosophy was to try and cast it away from super well-known actors who you'd be really familiar with from a one particular role. So we, we were preferring to do that, and so it narrowed and narrowed, and we needed needed somebody who was forty or so, and, and but wasn't that well known, but was absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, McKay had worked with him on The Big Short. He's got a significant but smallish role in that movie, and he, he, he was always very confident that he could do anything, which he can. Because he plays, in The Big Short, he's a very kind of assertive force. He's kind of, he again, doesn't quite have the, like, the sort of vulnerability or the kind of insecurities that he's keep. So is there something, is it during the audition process where you go, yes, I can see where this guy is going to bring that out? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um... Where the hell did you find Cousin Greg from? The, uh, <laughs> Nick, Where, Raw, Nick what, Braun or yeah. the guy? <laughs> or the, or the character? I actually kind of want to know both. Like, <laughs> what mystical tree is that dude living up? <laughs> yeah, he was, a ca- casting-wise, just a gift from God, like uh, Francine Maisler, who's a big uh, LA casting director, knew of his work. He's pretty well-known before the show, yeah. but s- slightly culturally different world. And... Um, the guy, yeah, somebody asked me on the, you know, you get asked these questions on the red carpet going in yesterday and somebody asked me if, who I would be in succession and I, I normally don't have a good answer to questions like that, but I think I would be Greg. You know, that was, that I was the Greg, if you want to know what I was like as a researcher for the Labour Party, that's, <laughs> I was, co- 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 you know, cousin Greg of the, uh, of 97. And um, so I'm not. Quite like cousin Greg, but I, does I that think make Blair Logan Roy? I th- yeah, he w- yeah, I was yeah, I was even further removed. I was a fifteenth <laughs> cousin in that to the to New Labour, but um, uh, but yeah, I, I he's uncomfortable in those rooms with those powerful people, and they're not they're rooms maybe I've been adjacent to sometimes, but not comfortably in. So he's he that's what that's his that's his thing, right? He's 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 a yeah. bit like us. He doesn't he doesn't feel very comfortable there. Um, can I can we get some questions from the audience? Because I am quite questioned that there's a lady right there. It's a really good question. I don't know. I don't. It's instinctive. I think. Uh, I think you know co- co- people who come in go into comedy. Uh, sort of per- people who maybe uh, f- see the comic angles in things, or you know, sometimes defence mechanism, um, or for you know, uh, toxic masculinity and um, three for uh, three. Ding ding ding. <laughs> no. Uh, um, uh, so I think it's a way of viewing the world that's amenable. If you if if that if that's how you start seeing the world. I'm not scared of going towards their psychology. I find it. And it's, the room is great for that. And so you have different people, different birth orders, men, women, all sorts of different experiences of life. And that's a great way, uh, you know, uh, if I see Shiv way X, having it challenged by someone else to think, oh, but maybe she's doing it for this reason, is a great way to come to, a, to, to build layers of complexity. Because I, I, I think um, if I'm proud of anything about the show, it's above all trying to do complicated people and yeah they're the what they do in the world is awful and they are um sometimes and they are objectively not making choices that are good for humanity but within that there's a lot of room for mixed feelings mixed emotions for where that's come from in in the in the broadest sense of where they are in the power structure of the world and in the very narrow sense of where they are in the power structure of their family. So being able to have both at once, like, yeah, they're terrible, but yeah, there's a reason, like a a simple level is really important.
Um, yeah, I think I'm uh, maybe a broken human being. That's never occurred to me. Um, I don't find them scary. I find, you know, nothing human is alien to me, kind of like anything that you can say is good to think about. I, I find that I find them intriguing, but I don't, I, <laughs> this might be, a, I don't find anything um, un unimaginable in what they imagine or how they behave or, or not, certainly not or things I've seen in other relationships or parts of life. So, um, no, but I'm going to be terrified now that the abyss is going to stare back into me. <laughs> I'm concerned for it. Um, can we grab, have we got time for another couple of questions? Yeah, this lady down here. Sure, it was, for anyone who wasn't there, it was just, it was really a lovely evening. There was such warmth from the audience. It was a big audience and they seemed to love the show and, it, uh, you know, it, um, I, I was very touched and um, to be in that auditorium and back in the UK with UK talent and UK writers in the room, it felt wonderful. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, and this touches all, also on race, you know, this, the, the world that they're in is a very male and very white world and there's, and therefore our cast is overwhelmingly white and male. It's not always a super comfortable space to be in, um, and it could be an excuse about not, you know, not using diversity that you're in that world. When we're in the wider world, we try and um, show an America that people would find recognisable. But, but um, if if we're trying to do, if we're trying to satirically or honestly approach that world, it feels like we need to show that it's mainly a male white world and then hopefully you can also as, as the show well from the start of the show you can also show the ways in which people who are who don't find that power structure amenable try and make themselves able to work within it and I guess uh, it, Jerry the character who's the Jay Smith Cameron's character who's the senior legal counsel and Shiv obviously um, uh, but particularly thinking of Jay, people have I found, found that character interesting uh, and she's grown importance in the show as we've done it. And I think, you know, people find a way often to work within those power structures and seeing that happen is really interesting and um, confusing and interesting. Oh, that's a good question. I should ask that. <laughs> um, both. Anything, right? Anything, I think, right, 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 right. Anything that makes you write is brilliant. So if you, if you feel like you, wanna, you might like to write shorts or you might like to write to try and get an agent, brilliant. Anything that will make you get to the end of that thing because it's easy to have the impulse to write and it's easy to sort of enjoy that mm, floaty feeling of one day I'm going to do something and as soon as you start writing it if you, you're if you're a normal human being your reaction will be and probably also if you're a good writer will be this is terrible <laughs> I, I, whenever you meet a, a, a writer and they say I've written this brilliant thing I always think hmm I think <laughs> think you think you might not be a writer my friend <laughs> Because the, normally the, the, the writer's impulse is, is, I think the writer's impulse is normally two things. This might be absolutely terrible. And then just a little bit of like, but I think it might be the best thing in the world as well. Um, so to get from that bit of like feeling that feeling of I might have something to say to writing that terrible, terrible draft that you hate, anything that will get you through that. And whether that's like having a date in the diary that we're going to shoot this little taster for YouTube, or if it's you've got a friend who you trust, and it has to be a bit of trust that they're going to that they'll give you a reasonably honest but not um, psychologically devastating <laughs> response. Anything that gets you, and, and a class can be really good for that, or a group. Me and Sam re met on a, a creative writing group, but you can do an informal one. It could be something you do with pals or something online, but anything to make you finish that draft and then do the next one. Brilliant, thank you. That's an absolutely, and I planned this all along, Perfect way to end uh, this this screen talk. Um, please, uh, will you join me in thanking for a brilliant afternoon, Jesse Armstrong? Uh, thank you, Nish. Thank you.